face the judgment. Therefore, so also Christ died once, taking upon himself the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. He took my appointment with, appointment with that, and he took my judgment. So now I can, through his life, I live. And so now I, I live in this vessel, this body, but I'll never die. 
It's so awesome. The body is growing old, the scripture says, and will deteriorate and eventually die. But the inner man is being renewed every day. The new creation is such an awesome reality. So we can encourage each other with these words. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. For we know that we cannot have her come to us or have him come to us. As David said of his child that died, I will go to him. I will go to her. And um, so David, after his child died, he anointed himself and he worshipped. They thought he was going to kill himself because he was like, oh my gosh, David's going to kill himself. He just lost his baby. You know, it's, uh, that's Bathsheba's first baby with David. And David was overcome with guilt, fear, and condemnation. And, he, and when, the baby, when they gave news to David, the baby had died, then they said, oh, what is he going to do? He's going to just go berserk. But David knew, like David could see beyond the scene, and David saw God's goodness. And so the scripture says he anointed himself in worship, and he came out of that room radiant. And he had another baby, Bathsheba had a second child, and his name was Solomon. The grace of God, the grace of God. So we can't have them come back to us, but we can certainly go to them. And we certainly will. We shall see them again. And it's so cool to hear so many of the testimonies, so, so many of the friends say, I'll see you again. I'll see you again. I'll see you again. And you know what? I think it's going to be sooner than we think. That's right. Amen. 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 Yes. And all this world is really deteriorating quickly. Yeah. The scripture says that toward the end of the world that the Lord would do a short work and cut it short. That he would shorten the days, lest the very <clears throat> saints of God would be overwhelmed. Not that we could ever you know, be so overwhelmed that we would deny our Lord, but he would cut the days short toward the end so that there's not a, a complete just misery among the body of Christ because mm -hmm. of, a, of a fallen world. Mm -hmm. So this thing could unravel real fast, who knows? But mm -hmm. I do know that our hope is not in this world and this is not our home. Yeah. Thank God this is not our home. And one day, the skies are going to open when we least expect it. And we're all going to be home. And we can't even fathom what it's going to be like. A new heavens and a new earth. And as, as Rocky said, who's Rocky said that? Or Caleb said? Yeah, Caleb, we're just beginning. It's just the beginning. So, though we have heavy hearts, you know, we, we have such hope. It's steadfast, like an anchor. It goes beyond the veil. Holds us steady in another reality, which is Christ. Jesus himself with us, in us, and we in him. dedicated Solomon's temple, they, they started to sing uh, and worship. And, uh, and when they said these words, God got really happy. They said, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. When they said those words, the scripture says, the presence of God, the manifest presence of God, the presence of God was already there, but the presence became manifest in a way where the singers could not stand. The presence of God became manifest in that temple to where they were weak in the knees and the musicians fell to the ground. And it was an awesome awareness that they were too weak to even stand because of his glory. Because they said simply, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Awesome. I love that. Because that's who he is. That's his heart. The enemy has tried to lie about him from the beginning. He's the father of lies. He speaks a lie because that's what he is. Always trying to misrepresent God. 
<clears throat> somebody finally gets it right as far as getting to know him as he is, he's like, yes, <laughs> that's me. I am good. And my mercy endures forever. Lord, thank you for this time together, the saints gathering together. Thank you so much for taking care of Tiffany and Sam. Thank you for being with Michael and Rocky, and Kayla and Chelsea and Travis, with Lynn and Lee. Surrounding them with so many good friends. The body of Christ comforting each other. Weeping with those who weep. Rejoicing with those who rejoice. Thank you for this reality. That you truly have overcome death. And we need not fear death anymore. For you came to destroy and render powerless him who had the power of death. That we might be so encouraged to live our life fully. Live our life fully without fear. Thank you, Lord. So awesome. So awesome. Telling Lynn, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to share today. Sometimes I really have a clear direction, sometimes I don't. Um, so I know whatever is going to happen from this point forward will be, will be the Lord. But I don't know what exactly or where. Um, phrase open heaven, what it means to me is <clears throat> we have such direct access to God that it's amazing. Um, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help and mercy in time of need. Um, Paul says we have access to the Father through Christ by one spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but we directed to the Father through the work of Christ by the Spirit. We have direct access to the Father. An open heaven. As Jesus used to say, He used to look up and say, Father, thank you that you hear me and I know that you always hear me. I love that. That's just before you raised Lazarus from the dead. He goes, Father, thank you that you hear me and I know that you always hear me. And so I'm just thinking, pondering how powerful that is that we have the ear of God. Mm -hmm. Just a whisper, and he hears his children. Just a whisper. Sometimes old, some of our old Pentecostal teaching in the past has told us that there's a brass ceiling. Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to pray through that brass ceiling. And you have to be <coughs> holy enough. And make sure you have all your ducks in a row and all your sins confessed up to date. And all this stuff. You never really know for sure with that kind of teaching whether you have a brass ceiling has been removed or not. You just hope for the best. It's such an inferior way of looking at what Jesus did. Because he not only opened the heavens to us. I love that, that word in Revelation where it says, I have opened the door that no man can shut. And I have shut a door that no man can open. And I think what he's referring to there is he's opened the door of heaven through him. And he shut the door that used to be open to God in a very, in a very limited way through the Jewish people, through the old covenant, through the temple <clears throat> sacrifices, the priesthood, behind a veil. Very limited opening to the heavens, behind a veil. Into the Holy of Holies, which was a cube, a perfect cube, a picture of heaven where the Shekinah glory would be behind that veil. That limited door that he opened just for the Jewish people. For salvation is of the Jew. 
is I shut that door. I ripped that veil in two. I shut that door that no man can open that door again. I'll, I'll never, ever, ever recognize that covenant again. I do not recognize the covenant from Sinai. I do not recognize it, God says. What does the scripture say in Galatians 4? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Cast out the law and the son, which is the flesh. Cast out this whole approach to God that he had set up for the Jewish people, which is merely a shadow, a picture of the good thing to come. For how can we be established in grace if we're still trying to live by law, Hebrews says. So he did away with the old covenant law that we might be established in grace. And so he shut that door, that limited door, and opened up a broad door, huge door, that whosoever would believe could enter in and have access. But he not only opened the door, but he also gave us something that's, that's truly amazing. This pondering this, was, he, he gave us union with himself. And I don't think we should ever, ever get over that. We can never get over that. I mean, that was the, the crowning work of Christ was not just to open heaven for us, but it really was to put heaven inside of us in him and through him. He said, those who believe on me, my Father and I will come and make our abode within them by the Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit making their abode within us. The scripture says we are living stones of a living temple, a new temple. That he raised up in three days. Speaking of his own body, his own work. That he raised up in three days, a new temple. And we have become the dwelling place of God. Living stones. So we not only have access to God, this open heaven. Um, but he is actually inside of us, and we are inside of him. These are the deep things of God. Scripture says the Spirit is given to, to reveal the deep things of God to us. Like Clark's been teaching on this series, which is so awesome, the Spirit's been given to show us the things that are freely given to us. The things that are freely given to us, the Spirit is given to reveal these awesome, awesome truths. And so many times, you know, religion has said the main, you would think the main work of the Spirit is to convict us of sin so we can get our act together and improve our lives and work on our lives. And that's so far from the truth. The Spirit is not sent to reveal sin in the flesh. That's what the law did. Through the law, sin in the flesh was revealed. The Spirit is not sent to, to go back to what the law did. The Spirit is sent to show us a great mystery of death and resurrection, of new creation. The Spirit has been given to show us the freely, the things that are freely given to us, underlined freely, that we truly have been moved from death and into life. These are mysteries that only the Spirit can reveal to us. And then in that place of union, in that place of, of new creation, what, what point is it to look at sin in the flesh? What point, think about that, what, what logical point is it to, to focus on sin in the flesh? Paul says, there's no good thing that dwells in my flesh. No good thing dwells in my flesh. Why am I looking for something good in the flesh? Why am I trying to improve the flesh? Why am I trying to work on the flesh? Why am I trying to, it's like that analogy we used a while back, how if you, get a, you have an old cell phone, and you buy a new cell phone, and you have the service canceled on the old cell phone, because the, the old cell phone was not working maybe, and so you, so you got a new cell phone. Now you got new service on the new cell phone. It is as pointless to look at flesh and sin in the flesh as it would be to look at the old cell phone now that has no service. You've already got a new cell phone with new service. Yes. And look at the old cell phone and try to figure out why is it not working. <laughs> and try to fix the old cell phone. See? That's exactly what God did. He gave us, so to speak, a new cell phone and a new service. It's a whole new ballgame. Cast out the old law and the son, the flesh. Don't consider it. Don't look for sin. Don't look for goodness in the flesh. You'll find nothing. But sin, as C.S. Lewis said, you'll find layers upon layers like an onion. You can, there's layers and layers and layers of flesh. And I hear sometimes this, this statement about, about New Covenant Christianity. I want to just share this. That I hear this statement sometimes that it's not about rule keeping, it's not about law, but it's about the heart. It's 
about the heart. I know what they're trying to say. That's not, to me, that's not really saying what it's about. Because when you say it's just about the heart, what they're really saying, I think, is that God wants your heart to be pure. God wants you to, to work on that heart. God wants your heart to, to be developed and to be more Christ-like. God is not into outward rule-keeping. I'll give you that. But he is into the heart. And he wants that heart to, to you know, search out your heart for any evil that may be there. That you might be a dedicated disciple, committed disciple, surrendered disciple. Mm. I hate that. I totally hate that. You know why? Because it's not the truth. The scripture says this. I have given you a new heart. A new heart. A new creation has come. And God is not working on your heart. That's the miracle of a new creation. Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new, and certainly the heart. As Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Your innermost being, your heart. If we know that we have a new heart, we will cease to try to fix ourselves and see him for who he is and those things that are freely given to us in him. That's the rest. Yes. By switching from law and outward works to just talking about working on your heart is just switching, like we said, chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> that's, that's, just a, that's another branch of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a more sophisticated branch on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is not the tree of life. A clear word a certain sound that must be sounded at this, in this message of grace must be a message that we have a new heart. Yes. The prophets prophesied this would come. Behold, the days come and I will wash you with clean water, pure water, and I'll give you a new heart. David prophesied prophetically, yearning for what you have now in Christ. In Psalm 51, he said, Blot out my sins before me, Lord. Blot out my transgressions before me. Create in me a new heart. Yes. See, he was yearning prophetically for what you and I have. Yes. Yet preachers will take Psalm 51 and say, this is the bar of soap for the Christian. Go back to Psalm 51 and wash your sins mm -hmm. and yearn for God to work on your heart as David did. No, 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 no. We must see what God has done in Christ. It's just stupendous. It's awesome. It leaves no, no gray and, and wishful thinking. It is, it is clear. It is a certain sound. It is awesome. It is nothing less than death and resurrection. It is a new creation. It is a new beginning. It is a new reality. And yes, there's a, pro there's a, pro a progression. There's a... There's a there is a progressive part of this, but what, what, what is the progressive part of this life, this journey with Christ on earth? What is the progressive part? It's not working on the heart to make it better. Who can do that? Only God can make a new heart. To even think that we can work on our heart and make it better is just really ridiculous anyway. But what is the progressive part of this? The progressive part of this, as Paul said, is the renewal of the mind. Our mind must catch up with what has happened in the spirit. Because we see in part, we prophesy in part, we understand in part because we work through these bodies, through these brains. We, don't, we can't see as clearly as we will see when we leave these bodies. You know what's the most awesome thing about Sam and Tiffany? The most, one of those awesome things about what they experienced? In the second of, of the body dying, the real Tiffany, and the real Sam, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. And they knew all things instantly, even as they are known by God. Awesome promise. Why can't we know all things now in the body? Because we are hindered by these brains. We are in weak earthen vessels. The scripture says we are working through a tissue, tissue from this creation. But the mind is being renewed in our spirit. The spirit teaches our mind. And we see things. We begin to understand things. And what happens in this dynamic is that 
more fruit is born in our lives as our mind is renewed to who God really is. For He is good and His mercy endures forever. And who we are in Him, sons and daughters of the living God with a new heart. Heirs of God and heirs of Christ. You couldn't be an heir of God if you weren't perfect. The law which can make nothing perfect was done away with as weak and useless, Hebrews says. Weak and useless. So that now a better hope has come in Christ that does make us perfect in Him. As Clark read last Sunday, a couple of Sundays ago about that. It's awesome. So anyway, that's one of my little soapboxes, I guess. I get, I get on because... It's, I just hate, I hate a, a muddled message. I hate, I hate this, this gray. I hate this. I mean, Paul says it should be a certain sound. If you don't have a certain sound, who shall prepare for battle? He said, you know, you got, and he was referring to in the Roman days, they'd have these armies across the land about to attack. And they'd have certain sounds of a trumpet that would mean either retreat or attack or go right, go left, whatever. And so if you didn't make that sound certain, the whole army wouldn't know what to do. You know, if you would like, if somebody was not skilled in, in making that one note, then the commanders over there would not know because they have to know quickly what to do. That's what Paul is referring to: a certain sound, a certain sound, and a certain sound is telling people that he really did. He really did. Jesus said, "When I return to earth." Will I find faith on the earth? Will I find someone who believes me? I love that. He didn't say when I return to earth, will I find someone holy enough or someone who has really dedicated their lives to me or someone who has really surrendered their lives to me. Will I, no. When I return to earth, will I find someone who believes me? Will I find faith when I return to earth? It's awesome. So we have this awesome access to God but we also have union with Him. And that's not possible if we didn't have a new heart. So the next time you hear a message and it's, it's talking about, you know, God working on your heart as a believer, or that your heart is still wicked, quoting Jeremiah, oh, the heart is desperately wicked, who can know it? Yes, that was true. In Adam, we all had wicked hearts. But now we receive the circumcision of the heart by the work of Christ. Through the death of Christ, I've been circumcised. The heart's been circumcised. A new creation has been raised. For God, Paul says, raises the dead and calls into being that which did not exist before. Think about it. How could he, how could he do all that he did and not make the heart new? God doesn't do things halfway. And the, and the fact that it, that it is an issue of the heart should help us see that it's got to be this way. And, of course, the Scripture teaches that. I think that one of the most healing things we could have in our own lives is to ponder daily the fact that at your core, your heart at your core, you are perfect. You are perfect. If you're not when are you going to get perfect enough for heaven? When? I mean, the moment you die, if you're not perfect at that moment, Tiffany and Sam didn't have a, a moment to say anything. It was instantaneous. And there's no scripture that says God is going to work on us between death and heaven. That's why we have silly stuff like purgatory. Teaching that God's going to purge us before we go to heaven because religion says, well, there's no way that this person is good enough for heaven. I see how he lived. Because they look on the outward appearance yeah. and not the inward, as Paul said. So we get silly doctrines like purgatory so that person, a person can be purged and be <coughs> in heaven. Or we just don't have any doctrine at all. We just say, well, God's going to do something. I don't, know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't understand it, but... Somehow, when I die, he's going to take me in because I, I guess just because of his grace. And he'll just finish it up fast. I don't know. <laughs> but all your life, you could have lived with the, with the awesome reality that you have a new heart. All your life. Yes. 
You can live with this awesome reality that there's no barrier between me and God. He has removed the wall. He has removed the barrier, which is sin. He has taken away the sin of the world. Awesome. Awesome. When he said, when he said this is the judgment of the world when he went to the cross, he didn't use the wrong words. He meant a, the judgment of the world. I mean, from beginning, from Adam to the end, in a great mystery, God put all the sin of mankind from beginning to the very end. For those who were not yet born, you and me, all sin was placed on him who offered himself up by the eternal spirit. In time, yet outside of time, a great mystery. He was from above. He was not from below. And yet he was fully man. So he was the mediator between God and men. And in some great mystery, God was able to put everything on him. For he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Awesome, awesome transaction that is a great mystery that was hidden and not revealed until Christ came. Yet the scripture says if the enemy had known of this great mystery, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the enemy had known this, if he had understood the hidden wisdom of the death of Christ, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The enemy would not have done it. The enemy thought he had him. The enemy who, the prince of death, thought death was, was everything. So the prince of death thought, I'll take him, crucify him. Not knowing the hidden wisdom that it was all in the plan of God that he would taste death for every man. Releasing all men, even those in Hades, even those who died before the flood of Noah, Peter said. All those who would believe on him. All those who would believe on him would be released. That's why Hades was divided into two sections. The Abraham's bosom and a great gulf separated Abraham's bosom from the rest of Hades. Or Sheol. The Hebrew word is Sheol. The Greek word is Hades. And those who died with faith in the heart, for God is able to see faith in the heart, they were divided. Those who had faith went to Abraham's bosom. Abraham being the father of faith. And the others... The other section of Hades. Jesus said a great gulf separated the two and they could never meet. And so when he descended, that's why he told the thief, this day shall be with me in paradise because paradise is another word for uh, uh, Sheol or Hades. Because paradise is, mm -hmm. the Greek, it means a protected enclosure. Mm -hmm. So that day he did descend with that thief to Abraham's bosom. In that section of Hades. That's why Revelation says, I have the keys to Hades and death. That's what he means when he says, the enemy shall not prevail against the gates of Hades. Shall not prevail. But that's what he was talking about. Not like some of these teachers who hear about spiritual warfare and stuff. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the gates of Hades shall not prevail against my work. Because when I finish my work, nobody who believes in me will descend to Hades again. Yes. And those who are there now shall be released. The gates of Hades, the gate speaks of the authority. The gates of Hades shall not prevail. See, now every believer, absent from the body, present with the Lord. There is no Abraham's bosom or Hades. There is no trip below for the believers anymore. There was a temporary trip because the sacrifice had to be shed on earth. The blood had to be shed on earth. Which is why Jesus said, no man has ever ascended into the heavens but the Son of Man who has descended. No man. Not Moses, not Elijah, not Enoch. No man had ever ascended into the heavens. For he must have preeminence in all things. He was the first man. The first man to ascend into the heavens. They all were taken to Sheol, to Abraham's bosom, where they were protected until the time. And I wish, I really wish Steven Spielberg would make a movie about that. Oh. I can just see it, you know. I can see it. Begin the movie at the cross. And see that thief, that, that unworthy person like us, unworthy, who couldn't even get baptized, who couldn't say, didn't even say the prayer right. <laughs> he just said, remember me, Lord, when, when you come into your kingdom. He didn't, he didn't do any good deed. He was being crucified for his bad deeds, nailed to a tree, so he had no way to do a good deed. I mean, he did everything wrong. But all he did was recognize Jesus. 
He humbled himself. The other thief didn't humble himself. He, he was just trying to save himself. You know, if you can do this kind of stuff, save us. Save you and save us too. He actually was cursing Jesus. One of the verses says, the other thief cursed him. Remember that? But the other thief humbled himself and talked to the other thief and said, don't you know what you're doing? We deserve this. This man has done nothing. His, his reputation, Jesus' reputation was, was out there. They knew what a good man he was, what, a, what an awesome man, how many people he had healed, how many people he had encouraged. And this other thief said, simply remember me, Lord, when you come into his kingdom. A picture of, the, of Jesus dying for the sins of the whole world, the believer and the unbeliever, because they were crucified with Christ. A picture of Christ tasting death for the believer and the unbeliever, though they, the unbeliever will not benefit from the death of Christ. As Galatians says, Christ will be of no benefit to you. But he descended with that thief. And I can see that movie. I can see it. I can see where this awesome special effects, you know, where the, where the Christ, you know, at his death, his last breath, the thief is still alive. They had to break the, the legs of the thieves, remember? So they couldn't breathe. They came to Jesus to break his legs, but in fulfillment of Scripture, that not a bone of his shall be broken. They said, he's already dead. They took a spear and they put a spear in his side just to make sure. And blood and water poured out. God can just see Jesus waiting for the thief. Because he died first. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I think Jesus waited on him. When that thief died, he crossed over. Two thieves crossed over. One descended really quickly to that other side of Sheol. But the other one, Jesus said, Come here. You're with me. You're with me. And they descended light speed into another dimension that we can't explain and came to that place called Abraham's bosom where David and Abraham and all the prophets were there rejoicing. Peter says he descended and even people who died in the flood before Noah were there proclaimed he proclaimed his victory on earth in Sheol. That's awesome. And then where there is no time in this dimension they began to just to swallow. I can see a whirlwind, this great wall separating the two groups. Like that. <laughs> a whirlwind separating Abraham's bosom. And then it said, He who descended also ascended and took captivity captive, meaning they all came with him. He led the way, and they all, by the power of God, were taken out because of the sacrifice had been made on earth. They actually came through the earthly realm. The scripture says some of those saints appeared to their neighbors and to their relatives in the book, in the, in the Gospels, and said, He has released us from Hades. And they would disappear. Their, their relatives, their friends would say, He has released us and disappear. And then He would take them all. He took them all. And those are the cloud of witnesses that are there now.